joining us today. Uh, with me today is a very special guest, um, Dick Passingham from University of Oxford. So for those who don't know you, could you say something about um, who you are and what you do? Uh, I'm a cognitive psychologist um, who took to brain imaging very early on in 1988 when positron emission tomography got going. And I've made a special study of the prefrontal cortex. Uh, and I've had research groups both in Oxford and in London. So the London group are at the Phil, which is the Welcome Center for Human Neuroimaging. And I'm in the psychology department in Oxford. Okay, very good. Thank you for that. So I'm very excited to talk to you this morning. Um, and I, I know that you uh, you say you adopted uh, brain imaging very early on. Uh, so when it was, yes. one, you're one of the first people to use it, actually, I believe. Is that correct? Well, uh, I shouldn't make too much of that. What happened was I heard a talk in Oxford given by Richard Popoviak. And he was at the MRC cyclotron unit at the Hammersmith Hospital in London. And it, he and Terry Jones were doing PET scanning at a time when the Karolinska was doing it. And um, it was being done in about one or two places in the USA. And I heard the talk that Richard gave, and I went down and said, could I collaborate? So from then on, I had a research group both in London and in Oxford, and the London group did the imaging. And for some years, we did positron emission tomography. But the uh, physicists there didn't believe when fMRI came along they didn't believe that the signal was genuine. They thought that it was due to movements. And indeed, there are movements that distort the image. There are artifacts. But this meant that we couldn't actually do fMRI at the MRC cyclotron unit because the MRI people didn't believe in it. So Richard Fakovic then uh, with a group of us, went to uh, Queen Square in London and built what became known in England as the Phil and is the Welcome Center for Human Neuroimaging. And for many years, that was one of the premier centers, together with uh, Montreal, uh, together with uh, University uh, Washington, and so on. Um, and, uh, I've run out of things to say. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Um, so, um, let me ask you some of the dangers in, uh, be, because I know cognitive neuroscience now is, uh, fMRI is, you know, there's hundreds of studies done, thousands probably, and there, there are some dangers associated with interpreting the data from there, and I know that you have some cautionary, uh, principles that you would like people to take to heart, uh, what do you think we're getting from the fMRI images um, exactly? What is it telling well, us about the brain? Uh, at the uh, Phil, I'll call it the Phil, the Welcome Center in London, uh, they brought in what we call project presentations. So if you were going to do a project, you had to present it to the whole group, and those happen every Friday, and many other labs have taken up the same. And I constantly used to ask, why do you need to do the imaging study? Why can't you tell from the behavior alone? In other words, what does the imaging tell you that you don't already know from the behavior? Right. So that's problem number one. Um, problem number two, um, if you see Let's say somebody's depressed. I'm going to take an example that I've used in a book. And you scan them, then you find two areas of the brain in which the activity is not normal. And it's very easy to conclude from that that depression is a brain disorder. Now, of course, in one sense, 
it's a brain disorder. You wouldn't be depressed if you didn't have a brain. <laughs> but to say it's a brain disorder is to imply that it starts with a problem in the brain, whereas there's an alternative, which is that your marriage broke up. Right. And as I point out in the book, if you scan people and you simply ask them to think sad thoughts while they're in the scanner, the same two areas show abnormal activity. So what you seem to be doing is just finding with a very expensive tool what you know already, which is that they're not feeling very well, <laughs> just thinking sad thoughts. Now, I'm not suggesting that depression might not be caused by problems in the brain. We know that there are genes, 44 genes, that increase the risk of depression. And those have to act by changes in the brain. But they probably act by changing how you react to stressful events. They make you more reactive, in other words. Um, but you might not have those genes. Your marriage is just broken up. And of course, if I scan you, I'm going to find you're depressed. Mm -hmm. But it's told me nothing that I didn't know. And so what I'm saying is just because I see those changes in the brain, that doesn't tell me whether what you've got is a brain disorder or not. And the same applies for lots of other things. And to use another example I've used in a book, if you scan gay people, you find, uh, and you show them pictures, then you find that if they're men and you show them pictures of men, there are changes in the hypothalamus that you don't see in heterosexual people. But, um, uh, if you then, um, uh, uh, the, uh, the problem is that all you may be doing is tell, showing what you know already, which is that they find these attractive. Right. Because if you show uh, men who are heterosexual women, you find the same changes. Right. Yeah. So it's another example where people think the images are telling them something when actually all they may be doing is telling you what you already know from the behavior. And by the way, we have a brain. <laughs> by the way. <laughs> by the way. And, and um, I'm not suggesting that everything is the brain. You've got a body as well. Uh, you know, but but um, uh, so that's one problem. There's another problem which uh, has become much there's much concern about, which is that imaging studies in the old days we used to have six people in a group, and um, we then did statistics. Yeah, so have six people in one group and six people in the control group, and you did statistics, and then people thought, "Ah, oh, well, when fMRI came, we only use six because positron emission tomography involved uh, radiation, and we didn't want to uh, radiate too many people." Sensible, <laughs> but when fMRI came along, it was very expensive, so. Uh, uh, 12 people and so the norm became that you did studies with 12 people but then there became a crisis and the crisis first happened in fact outside the imaging community Dan Kahneman pointed out that the priming studies that social psychologists were doing where let's say you show them words that are synonyms for aging and then claim that they walk out of the room more slowly. Right. He challenged them to replicate these studies. There was a replication crisis over priming studies. 
But then Manafo um, uh, uh, showed that if you look at studies with genes and you try to find genes that are associated with psychiatric disorders, you find them, but then other people fail to replicate. So there began to be a replication crisis across biology. And it then hit imaging. And the main reason it hit imaging is because we were using groups that were much too small. Yeah, underpowered for statistics. So the statistics were much underpowered. And Russ Pondrak at Stanford has been one of the people, he's not the only one, but um, both in his blogs and in books, has been one of the ones who's really been pushing that we must use many, many more people. And in the Connectome project that David Van Essen um, looks after in America, uh, where they scanned 1,200 people, of whom many were twins, both identical and non-identical, mm -hmm. you've got sufficient power. And there are now even studies where what you do is you have um, uh, many people studied in one lab, many other people studied in another, many others studied in another, and you put all the data together, and you get huge groups. Right, right. So uh, imaging, which looked as if it was going to be glorious, um, had problems of interpretation and now has problems of replication. Right. And, and would you also say there's a problem with the, the, the cause and effect relationship? So that uh, seeing a particular area is differentially activated between two conditions. Um, so people then make all sorts of inferences about what the cause of the behavior is. Oh, this area must be the, the thing that's producing it. And that seems to be not what's uh, warranted by the, by the imaging. No, well, that, that, that's in a sense the depression point. You see cha these changes, which are in what are called the subgenual cortex and the amygdala, but actually uh, they may not be the cause. The marriage breakup may be the cause. And um, there are many other problems. One is that uh, the uh, false is very easy to say area A is not activated, when in fact the truth is that if you put electrodes in and recorded from the cells, you'd find they were active and you simply don't have sufficient power. Yes. Yeah, I agree. That's, I mean, my own background uh, from laboratory work, I did ERP stuff, but also uh, single cell recordings in animals. And I just, fMRI is an important tool, but there is this problem, I think, where people don't find the activation and then assume, well, then there isn't any activation there. Whereas the tool may just be too coarse grained to actually be picking it up. Yeah, uh, to a specific example. We did a study very early on, on prefrontal cortex. Uh, we taught people finger sequences. So they had to learn sequences of finger movements and we gave them feedback so that they learned it. And we taught them and then we studied them where they had learned it and it was automatic. And what we found is during the learning, prefrontal cortex was very active, but when the finger sequences were automatic, we saw nothing in prefrontal cortex. Mm -hmm. And it's very easy to conclude that there's no activity there. Now, um, there's a single unit study done in Earl Miller's lab in which they looked at a similar situation. So they were teaching, they weren't sequences, but they were teaching tasks. And this is in this case to macaque monkeys. And um, there were two conditions, one in which they were learning anew and one in which they had familiar pictures. And there was a delay. It was what's called a delayed matching task. So you were shown a picture and then after a delay, you're shown two more pictures and you have to pick the one that was the same. That's the task. 
And if the pictures were novel, then during that delay, when they're remembering the first picture, there was activity as measured by electrodes. If the pictures were familiar, there was very little activity during the delay, but there was activity just before the two new pictures, the, the two uh, response pictures are presented. And of course, in imaging, you'd miss that. In other words, that's the difference between tonic activity and phasic activity. And on the whole, my suspicion is that imaging is very good at picking up tonic activity and very bad at picking up phasic activity. So my suspicion is that if we had done the sequence study with monkeys and we'd recorded, then just before each finger movement, even though it was automatic, we would have found activity, even though we didn't see it in the imaging. Interesting. Yeah. Um, well, I, I'll ask about something in a second. But so I'm wondering, since you mentioned the prefrontal cortex, if we could talk about that for a while. So I know yeah. that's your uh, area of expertise, a special expertise. Um, you've done a lot of work on both humans and in uh, monkeys, I think, macaques, yeah. right? So uh, very interestingly, the, the prefrontal cortex seems to sit at the top of a couple of hierarchies. So I know you guys, uh, you think it's at the top of the action hierarchy, also the top of the vision hierarchy. That's so what we're if, saying. Well, yeah. not just vision, sensory. So, right. So I wonder yeah. if you could give us your take on what the function of the prefrontal cortex is. What is it doing that it needs all these inputs? <laughs> so, simple question, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just working on the second edition of the book. <laughs> um, uh, The standard answer that you would get if you asked a neuroscientist would be that prefrontal cortex is involved in decision making. That's the standard answer that you would get from people who were recording in animals and people who were doing studies in people. But as you pointed out, it sits at the top of a sensory hierarchy. So, in other words, there's a whole chain of information processing going on before you get to the prefrontal cortex. And then it doesn't project straight to the motor cortex, but there's a whole chain of areas through which it then sends information to the motor cortex. So it's performing some transformation between those sensory inputs at a high level and those motor outputs at a high level. Now, in a book I wrote, uh, oh, in 93, I think, I thought that what prefrontal cortex did was um, support what I call conditional behavior. If sensory context A and you want outcome B, then do X. But the problem is that prefrontal cortex, strictly defined, is unique to primates. But rats can do problems like if sensory cortex A, if sensory um, context A, and out desired outcome B, then do X. So it looks, and I'm now depending very much on the work that Earl Miller's lab has done. Uh, and it might help if I give some examples when I, I've told you this. Um, it looks as if the representations in prefrontal cortex are very abstract. So the rules, conditional rules are very abstract. And so, for example, in Earl Miller's lab, Jonathan Wallace and Earl Miller uh, 
recorded in monkeys while monkeys did delayed matching. I've told you, you're shown a pattern, and then after a delay, you're shown two more, and you have to pick the same pattern. And they found cells that fired when you're shown pattern A and you pick pattern A. But then they found that the same cells fired for the general rule matching. In other words, it didn't matter what the inputs were. It didn't matter what the patterns were. They were firing for a very general rule. Hmm. So it looks really as if the key to prefrontal cortex lies in thinking of it as supporting abstract rules for behaving. Now, it gets all these sensory inputs, and then it gets very direct information about desired outcomes from what's called the orbital frontal cortex, which is the lower part of the prefrontal cortex. And then it's got, a, uh, it's got um, outputs, as I say, indirectly to the motor cortex. So I think that we would now want to say that it supports very abstract behavioral rules. It, you would say that the same in the case of the sensory case as well, is it when we're not talking just about behavior? Yes. Um, now, at the moment, I'm, I've just started revising a, a monograph that I wrote with Steve Wise. For, uh, he's at NIH. And um, I'm going to change my mind over some things. Okay. And in the, in the preface, which I've written, because I always believe in starting from the beginning and then working to the end, <laughs> and, and so... I've written the preface for the, for the second edition. I point out that you're no good as a scientist if you've never been wrong. It's good point. Well, one of the things that we said in the first book, first edition, was that the prefrontal cortex was important where what you did depended on a single event, something that had just happened. But both Steve and I now think that we over that and that it's really not just single events, it's more recent events. So that's a sort of finesse that we want to put. And it's an important uh, uh, characteristic of the monograph that we wrote that we put the hypotheses in italics. And in the last chapter, we actually try to say how those hypotheses could be falsified. Because it's a real problem, I think, that in neuroscience and in imaging neuroscience in particular, many of the things that people say are not stated clearly enough so that it would be easy to falsify them. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I quote Minsky, who said that if he's believed something for five years, he doubted it. <laughs> and I think that's a very good rule. <laughs> okay. And I knew David Marr very well. Uh, because I was a graduate student at the same time and in the same place as he was. And David Marr, who uh, founded or was one of the founders of computational neuroscience, um, in his early papers had a starring system so that of the claims that he made, he'd give them three stars, two stars, or one star. And if three stars turned out to be wrong, the whole thing falls. Mm -hmm. If one star is wrong, well, that's a branch. And in his original cerebellar theory, theory about how the cerebellum works, it took 10 years before somebody could test 
the three-star prediction. And sadly, uh, David Ma had died by then. He died early. Um, so we felt in our book that it's very, very important to make sure that whatever we say about prefrontal cortex can be falsified. And for that, you need to be clear. And the trouble with being clear is it becomes obvious when you're wrong. Yeah, exactly. So as I go on reading the book, given that, as I hope it's clearly written, it will become more and more obvious where we're wrong. <laughs> yes, that's very good. Um, yeah, I, I think that's a very important point. Uh, do you have any examples of things that you think are sort of too vague to be, too, not clear enough yes. to be? Yes, it's often said that prefrontal cortex performs executive functions. Yeah, what's that? <laughs> How do you falsify that? What's, what's not going to be an executive function? Um, uh, and um, yeah, so I I think that this desire to be clear and to um, suggest how things could be falsified the the reason we came up with it was that I had a training in philosophy. I did philosophy and psychology together because at that time in Oxford, you couldn't do psychology on its own. Wow. And I was taught in the 1960s by Dick Hare, who became professor of ethics uh, in Oxford, and by Tony Kenny. And I was taught theory of mind, uh, sorry, I was taught um, uh, philosophy of mind by Tony Kenny. So, just two comments about that. One, in a tutorial, and in Oxford, students have tutorials, which means that two people, say, write a paper, which is then discussed in the tutorial with the tutor. And Tony Kenny had just written a book on uh, philosophy of mind, published by Rutledge. And a, a question I was given to write on, um, was talked about in his book, and I looked in his book, and I served it up in my paper. And um, after I'd read it, he said, I don't agree. And being a, a young, uh, I was taken aback, um, uh, because he just written it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Uh, and he said, yes, I've changed my mind. And I've never forgotten that. He genuinely, on this particular issue, had changed his mind. Now, another thing that really influenced me was having tutorials with Dick Hare. And the reason was that Oxford philosophy in those days was it was the premier school of philosophy. This was before uh, basically America took over when logicians, particularly in America, um, became very well known and, 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 and Oxford uh, sort of lost its, its world ranking. But this was a time when the whole time people were saying, what do you mean? Right, <laughs> ordinary language philosophy. Exactly. And I, I was brought up with that. So Dick Hare would constantly say, what do you mean? And that led me to read Bertram Russell in particular, because Russell, uh, obviously I never read Principia Mathematica, Russell, in his pop writings, write, for, forget the fact it's funny, he writes clearly. Yes. And I, um, for many years, 
I, I read Russell and I worked on writing so that I would, every sentence I would prepare beforehand and I put A, B, C, D, E and so on. And I'd make sure that the first sentence of the next paragraph was a logical link from the previous one. And I did this for years and then it just became part of me. So I taught myself, I hope, to write clearly. And the reason is that's honesty. Yes, yeah. And the reason that I don't like, oh, I, want, I shouldn't mention any philosophers because I don't want to offend anybody over the air. Okay. <laughs> Some philosophers who are very well known who write a lot, but it doesn't have the sort of logical precision that Dick Hare's books had. Um, and uh, I, I, when, when I'm asked um, about this, I recommend people to read Medua's uh, review of the book, The Phenomenon of Man by Théard de Chardin. Now, Théard de Chardin was a French priest and he wrote this book, The Phenomenon of Man. And Medua was uh, an English immunologist in Oxford who won the Nobel Prize. And he was very influenced by Popper and wrote about the philosophy of science himself. And his review of Théard de Chardin is the most dramatic tearing apart <laughs> that you've ever seen. And if you haven't read it, it's, it's, it's online. Um, uh, and um, I'll put a link to it in the comments it, below. Yeah, find it online. It is absolutely devastating. And the main point is that Terre de Chardin didn't write clearly because he couldn't think clearly. Right. Yeah, they're connected, definitely. And we all know that if you want to think clearly, the best thing to do is put it down. In the old days, you wrote with a pen, but now you write on the computer. But that's the best way of clarifying your thoughts. Yeah, I agree. I often tell my students that they don't really know what they think until they try to write it out. Exactly. Yeah. So um, philosophy, uh, having a training in philosophy, I think, had an effect. For years, I said, I wish I hadn't done philosophy. <laughs> and I'm very rude about philosophers. Um, but as I say, the truth is that I benefited from doing philosophy, and I knew it. Um, <clears throat> let me tell you why I'm rude about philosophers. Okay, good. <laughs> um, I have no problems at all with sitting in the armchair and thinking about issues of morals, issues of law, issues of the logic of maths. Um, these are all things that can only be done sitting in an armchair and thinking. My problem comes when philosophers do philosophy of physics or philosophy of neuroscience. Now, of course, I don't know uh, what philosophers of physics say and do. And so what I get when I ask physicists may be sour grapes. Yeah, a little bit. But what the physicists tell me is that when I ask them, have the philosophers actually contributed to physics, is, is no. Now, if on the other hand, I think about Einstein, 
then I have to worry because Einstein sat in his armchair and he did thought experiments. Right. He never did experiments. And did he contribute to physics? <laughs> One thing so. I believe he did. <laughs> yes. They tell me he did. So I think I have to leave physics because I have to admit that, you know, there are going to be people like Einstein. I don't know if Schrodinger or D Dirac did, did um, uh, experiments. I, I I doubt it themselves. It's quite clear that just sitting and thinking, you can contribute in a major way to physics. Mm -hmm. So then the question becomes, does just sitting and thinking, can you contribute to neuroscience? And obviously the biggest problem that uh, philosophers have thought about is consciousness from Descartes on. And so the question then becomes, have philosophers contributed to our understanding of consciousness? And it's then that I get worried. But there has to be a rider, which is that I don't read what philosophers are saying at the moment much. So they, there may be lots of people saying lots of things that I really don't know and that are contributory. But I have read Van Dennett and I have read, I've read some of the obvious things. I know you've read Ned Block and uh, David Chalmers. I've but read Ned Block, I've read Searle and so on. And um, so, as I say, the question becomes, is, is the an issue like consciousness one where simply thinking about it is going to get us further forwards. Now, I've, when people have done in Oxford philosophy and psychology and then asked me what they should do afterwards and they said they want to go on doing both, I've said, no, 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 don't do that. Drop the philosophy. Just go and do in the science. And the reason is that science changes very quickly. You know, for any young scientist, all that matters is what's happened in the last five years. Things are moving apace. Philosophy is a bit different. <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I talk to philosophers and they're still talking about Plato. So, uh, um, so I say, no, 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 go into science. Now, as you know, Ha Kuan Lao worked with me as a graduate student and as a uh, um, postdoc afterwards. And he was one such that, that I said, no, 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 you know, drop the philosophy, just do psychology. But as you know, and obviously you know him and you've interviewed him, uh, Ha Kuan has in fact kept up his interest in philosophy. And he writes, in his blogs, pieces which can reasonably be thought of as being philosophy. Yeah. Um, so, let's get back to the question. Does sitting in the armchair and just thinking about consciousness, can you get anywhere? Well, I've just read Tim Bain's article in which he looks at uh, Tononi and others' uh, integrated information theory. Yeah, the axioms of IIT. Yeah. Exactly. And I read that, and I see it as a very good sort of piece clarifying whether these genuinely are axioms and whether the deductions are genuinely deductions. But of course, I don't at the end find the solution to consciousness at the end of the article. Right. So what he's done is a very, very good job because philosophers are trained to think very clearly and they're trained in logic. So let's get back to consciousness. Does a training 
in logic help us understand consciousness? Well, the alternative is to study it. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm comparing sitting in the armchair thinking about it as opposed to getting into the lab and doing experiments. So let's take one of the experiments that Tononi did. Well, he showed that um, as you wake up, what happens in the brain is that areas that were not talking to each other, not communicating with each other, begin to communicate with each other. That's where the integration, integration comes from. Um, and he did, he did an experiment using transcranial magnetic brain stimulation, which, which showed this effect. And there are other people in Oxford who've shown that as you go to sleep, so areas stop talking to one another and so on. So experiments are beginning to tell us something about what happens when we go from sleep to wake or wake to sleep. And then there are experiments, of course, uh, in which you present stimuli which people either do see or only see sometimes because they're very dim or whatever, and you look to see what happens in the brain when they see something as opposed to when they don't see, when they miss it. And we know from recent experiment by Stander N in, in Paris that um, if you look in the brain in a monkey, these are monkeys, and you compare the first visual area to which vision a uh, cortical area to which vision projects, and then a, a later one called V4, and then prefrontal cortex. So he's recording in these three areas, and he's recording with electrodes. And you compare what are called hits with misses. So the monkey's asked to detect targets, and it presses a button when it detects a target. And of course, some of the, the targets it will detect, and some, because then they're, they're dim, they'll miss. And you can compare hits with misses. And if you look in primary visual cortex or the visual area V4, on the whole, there's not very much difference in the activity. But you look in prefrontal cortex, and there's very little activity for misses. In other words, what's happening in prefrontal cortex seems to be closer to what you and I are aware of than is activity earlier in the system. Now, those are the sorts of experiments that seem to me to begin to tell us something about consciousness. And my worry is what is going, sitting in the armchair going to do? Now, of can course, I, can I... a philosopher could say to me, well, look, as a philosopher, I'm trained to think logically. And my reply to that is, I can think logically. <laughs> You don't need to tell me. Why can't I do that thinking? Where is the room for somebody to just do the thinking? Right. No, I think that's a very important point. <clears throat> I wonder if I could kind of uh, press you a little bit on this and follow up. So, it, so you, you, I think you're kind of unique with this philosophical background that you have. Um, as a scientist, I don't know a lot of scientists who uh, were doing psychology and philosophy at the same time. And I think maybe there's a, a, a risk of um, 
of uh, especially when it comes to consciousness, but with the mind in general, I think there's a risk of, of people thinking they're experts already because they have a mind, they are conscious. Yes. And so uh, there, there's a risk for, of scientists sort of taking their naive um, pre-theoretical assumptions about what these phenomena are. I think Tononi is in a special example of, of this kind of thing because he starts with these axioms, which really just encode his pre-theoretical intuitions about consciousness. This is how he thinks of the phenomena as being unified, having cause and effect power, all that kind of stuff. Um, so without doing the, the training first of being very clear about what assumptions are, what justifies assumptions, which I don't think scientists are really taught, to be honest, um, there's this, you run the risk of importing your naive assumptions into your science. Do you, do you think that that's a fair characterization or no? I think my challenge is, tell me one thing that a philosopher has found about consciousness. Well, I mean, so is it that they have to find something or can't they just contribute to clear thinking about it uh, so that others can be clear about well, what why, they're looking for? Is, why can't I think clearly? Now, you're saying Tononi doesn't think clearly. And uh, now, Tononi, I, he probably was a mathematician or what? I don't know what his training was. Do you know? Yeah, I'm, it's not that I'm not saying, well, I do, but it's not that I'm saying that he doesn't think clearly uh, because I've met him. I know he thinks very clearly. But what, what I'm saying is that there's a, a, a danger in importing as, assumptions um, and taking them as kind of bedrock because you know, he has conscious experience and his experience, it seems this way to him. So then he goes and, and tries to formalize that into some kind of axioms, but the axioms are really, um, they aren't axioms in the sense that you find in mathematics or logic. They're just assumptions about the way consciousness works, which would also need to be tested uh, not, not empirically and not used as the starting point of constructing a test. Yeah, I, I think, I mean, I, I, I don't have any sympathy with the way Tononi is going about it. Um, as I say, I would much prefer the sorts of experiments, very simple experiments that I've been talking about. Right. Um, uh, um, and, and I'll come to one critical one in, in a minute. Um, in other words, I think Tononi did do an experiment very early on, which showed that areas communicate with each other when we become aware as we go from sleep to waking and i think that was important but many other people are working on communication between areas and in different states um i i wouldn't want to try to study consciousness by setting up a set of axioms in the way he is. I would simply want to do some very simple experiments, like ask where in the brain is the activity closest to what the person reports. Now, I've told you that the, the answer to that from the Stander-Enns experiment is, it looks in a monkey as if it's the prefrontal cortex. Now, there's a very simple test. If that were true, and if prefrontal cortex were removed from both hemispheres, the question is, would the monkey be aware? And the question is, can we test that? Now, uh, Alan Carey and Petra Sturry did an experiment with monkeys. And uh, it went like this. Uh, they taught the monkey, if you see a light, touch it on the screen. If there's no light, touch a square. And then they removed the visual cortex from one hemisphere. And that means that the monkey couldn't see anything on the opposite side 
of space. They then tested that the monkey still knows the rule. So if you present in the space which the monkey can see, because that's supported by the intact hemisphere, if you present a, a dot, the monkey touches it. If there's no dot, the monkey presses the square. So the monkey still knows the rule. Now, if you present the spot in the blind part of space, quotes, the monkey always presses the square. He always says, she, he, that he, she doesn't see it. <laughs> so we have a way of asking the animal, did you see it? So if prefrontal cortex were critical for awareness, and if we remove prefrontal cortex, in principle, it ought to be possible to ask the monkey this way, whether it sees things. Now, a long time ago, uh, in 1962, Pat Goldman, as she then was, did remove prefrontal cortex in both hemispheres in monkeys. And they could still discriminate between visual stimuli. That is, they could tell the difference between a plus and a square. Mm -hmm. And they were not blind, by which I mean they didn't bump into things. So the question is, does that show that you don't need prefrontal cortex for awareness? Or, as Hakuan Lau thinks, were in fact these monkeys showing what Larry Weisskrantz called blindsight? In other words, the ability to do the task while actually you're not aware of the stimuli. Mm -hmm. So I haven't found a way. I'm, I'm sort of trying to move to a way of trying to find, I'm not going to do this experiment, but I'm, I'm thinking now, what would the experiment be that would tell us whether you needed prefrontal cortex for awareness? Because as you know, in the field, there is a dispute between whether it's sufficient to have activity in early visual areas, or whether you also need to have activity in prefrontal cortex. Right. And a critical test would be what would happen if you had no prefrontal cortex. Now, I don't see in this sort of conversation how philosophy is going to contribute. Except in the following way. It worries me in the experiment that Alan Cowie and Petra Sturrock did. It's very easy to conclude that what the monkey was doing was telling you something about its awareness. But what it may have been doing is simply telling you something about the external world. Right. And saying there wasn't a spot. So that brings up the issue of whether by awareness we mean what we call metacognition. Do we mean when we say that we are aware, that we are aware of that? So we know that Hakwa Lau, with a philosopher, wrote a paper on metacognitive theories of awareness. And that's an example where, um, you know, a philosopher 
I think, did contribute uh, to the issue of how should we define awareness? Does it necessarily involve a metacognition or not? I don't right. know what your view on that is. <clears throat> well, you know, Hawkwin and I have a paper on this uh, where... I don't know! <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, might, I might be that philosopher you're mentioning. I don't know who you had in mind. <laughs> no, you're not! <laughs> okay. <laughs> it was Rosenthal. Oh, okay, yeah, David. Yeah, I studied yeah. with David at the Graduate Center. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, so, uh, I mean, my own view is that these are, it's, it's an empirical issue, but, uh, and I, I don't really know, but um, uh, my view is certainly the evidence is, seems to be uh, not in favor of just the sensory cortices doing uh, the work. Yeah. So, so it seems to me, I did, if I had to bet right now, I'd bet that the prefrontal cortex is, is sufficient. It's, it's uh, necessary I, and sufficient. I've accused Hakwan of defining awareness in such a way that it has to be metacognitive. Mm -hmm. And he uh, comes back at me, as Hakwan does, <laughs> and says, no, 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 he's not defining it. Um, so I think this is one issue where philosophers could help us. When we mean I'm aware of X in the external world, does that or does that not involve metacognition? And you don't think that's merely a definitional issue? I, I worry that it might simply be that Hakwana defined it so. Mm -hmm. But it's the sort of thing where, that, that, I mean, that's exactly philosopher's training. Right. Right. So, <clears throat> can I I'm not saying that I don't like philosophers. I, I'm challenging them to come up with, I'm challenging them to move the field on. And um, there's a problem, which is that when I did philosophy in Oxford, uh, the philosophers of mind were simply not interested in empirical science. Mm -hmm. And it has become a tradition in America, in North America in general, uh, uh, through Ned Block and Searle and, uh, and many others, um, that um, uh, you do take note of empirical things. But when I read Patricia Churchland's book, uh, sorry, she's written more than one, but the, the one I've read. <laughs> Brain trust or? I just felt that she was just giving an account of neuroscience. I didn't see where the philosophy came in. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, Patricia's oh. work is, is trying to use neuroscience to deal with philosophical problems, which she calls neurophilosophy. So I guess that's, she would take that as kind of, yeah, that's what she's doing. Um, but it's not supposed to be just philosophical. It's supposed to be neuroscience trying to answer questions that philosophers have traditionally tried to answer. Well, Obviously, there are many problems that philosophers have tried to answer, like what is life? And, and there was the élan vital and all the rest would have turned out to be issues to do with um, DNA and copying and development and so on. Mm -hmm. And philosophers have worried about consciousness and it is my feeling that that's now coming out of the philosophy field and into empirical science. Yes. Um, now, there are other issues, though, than consciousness that philosophers think about and talk about and then um, discuss empirical uh, data. For example, Searle discusses the Libet experiment. Yeah. It's the famous experiment done in 80, 1989 when he showed that if you ask people when they're aware 
first aware of pressing their finger, it's about 400 milliseconds before they press it. Whereas if you look in the EEG, you study the brain waves from electrodes outside the brain, you can find a signal 500 milliseconds or even a thousand milliseconds before. And there's been a lot of discussion on whether the experiment's right, on whether the interpretation's right, uh, and so on. And philosophers have contributed to that discussion. Um, by the way, as a side note, I just read that the Libet experiment was uh, recently passed its um, replication test. Someone replicated it pretty well, actually. Well, Hakwan, uh, Hakwan did it in my lab, and, and we, we got 400 milliseconds and so on. And um, uh, no, it, it passes its test. Um, but there are worries. Um, the question is, when were you first aware? But um, uh, in uh, Mark Hallett's lab, he thought of another way of asking when you were aware. And he had beeps coming on every now and again. And when you heard a beep, you had to think, were you aware of getting ready to make the finger movement? Mm -hmm. And he got times which were much earlier but he didn't have to be a philosopher to do that right. <laughs> <laughs> all right let's get back to so there's issues of free will does the libet experiment show that my brain is in some way pushing me about well that's ludicrous of course because i am my brain and my body uh, there's nothing for my brain to push about. <laughs> then Searle says, oh, well, for free will, we have to have some sort of random generator in our brain. And if we're not careful, we'll get into quantum physics and all the rest. <laughs> or hell will we break loose. <laughs> uh, uh, but clearly, there is an issue an interesting philosophical issue of um, the difference between free will and um, uh, and things that we do are not free. We we do things. I can. Searle used to just put his arm up in a lecture to demonstrate free will. He still does that. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I got a, I got a photo of him doing it, and. Um, uh, uh, it's not free now, it's automatic. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he should be wiggling his nose. But um, um, it is an issue that animals, not just us, animals do things of their own accord. They don't just respond. We don't just respond to external stimuli. There are internal changes in the brain that lead us to doing things. And um, so does that bring up a question of free will? I, I don't see why the fact that there are internal changes in my brain that lead me to doing things means that I'm not free. The argument presumably is that there is a causal chain leading up to those internal changes. And if there's a causal chain, where's the freedom? And my worry is that philosophers will go on worrying about that till the next century. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let, so I, this is very interesting. Um, what, one question I would ask is, well, I have two questions, but one that I'll ask right now is, um, so if you take some of the work like from John Dylan Hayes, Haynes' yes. uh, lab, where they, they try to extend some of these Libet findings, and as far as I've understood it, they, they get like the, with, with multivariate pattern analysis, yeah. they can predict like oh, almost up to three seconds 
in advance of a well, simple decision. Uh, John claims it's much earlier, but 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 um, let's say three seconds, just just for the moment. Okay, so if just, so, just, yeah, go on. Oh, I was going to say so. Just one way to try to press this free will question might be in terms of prediction rather than in terms of cause and effect. So, if if you could predict, if you in principle could predict what someone will in fact decide to do well before they have decided it then doesn't that seem if that were uh established empirically wouldn't that challenge traditional notions of free will or even there do you think that there's uh well um uh freed it's like freed has recorded in the brains of patients when they're doing the Lebet task and he finds cells um firing well before the movement um uh, the prediction was at 57 percent right barely above 50 percent is but of course it's not fair for me to say that because techniques will improve if you uh if jim haxby shows people different pictures like a chair scissors a person and so on he can, using multivariate pattern analysis, get predictions up to 80% or 90% of what they're seeing from studying the pattern of activity in the brain. So it will be fair to say what would happen if John's methods improve and he gets that prediction up to 80%. And you're asking me, Given that you can predict what they're going to do, does that mean they had to do it? Or would it put uh, would it put pressure on the more traditional notion of free will as as laypersons conceive it? Because I think there's also this issue that philosophers like to talk about compatibilism. Um, that you know, there's a kind of free. I, I know Dennett's work is involved heavily in this. That there's a kind of what called a control system in the brain which may be completely determined, uh, but still, since it's internal to us and so forth, it's a sense in which we're making our own decisions. So I, I think that's one area philosophers could contribute is by distinguishing the traditional notion of, you know, the random, I can do anything, screw the laws of physics kind of free will from this other, uh, well, isn't there some kind of control mechanism inside the brain which produces our responses, uh, which may be determined or not. But so what my question, so that's a different issue, but my question was, let, let me just stop you there. Okay. Because I want to agree with you for a minute. <laughs> okay. <laughs> in other words, what you've done is picked up another issue, as in the case of awareness, where we need to be clear what we mean by awareness. We need to be clear what we mean by freedom, by free will. And I don't want to stop philosophers thinking about that because I think that is indeed their job. And uh, uh, that's going to be helpful if we understood, but especially because of issues of law. Right. Because it's, you know, so you find somebody and they've got a tumor in the amygdala and they go to the top of a tower and they kill people. Um, and uh, are you going to send them to the electric chair or not? Were they free or not? These are issues where clearly we, uh, they're like issues of moral philosophy, where, where they're central to philosophy. So, yeah, I don't want to deny that um, understanding the concepts, the use of these words, is going to help us. Now, I interrupted your question, and I'm hoping you've forgotten it. <laughs> Sadly, I have not. <laughs> oh, I, <haven't. laughs> I mean, my question was just whether the if uh, we did, so if the kind of work from uh, John's lab was really accurate <clears throat> and could predict up to five seconds. I've heard some yeah. astonishing claims, you know, from him. But so say if you could predict in advance what someone will, in fact, do, doesn't that sort of put pressure on the traditional notion of free will? Um, so, so whether or not, so, so sort of bypassing the question of, yeah, are there 
causes which precede effects. That's sort of yeah. obvious. Yeah, yeah. The brain's massively connected. Obviously, something's happening before I decide to yeah. do something. That's kind of yeah. trivial. But isn't there still an issue here that um, could impact the more philosophical question of do we have this kind of so-called libertarian free will ability to, you know, have done otherwise or these other more, you know. But, but I think now what you're saying is that findings in neuroscience are challenging some of the concepts that we or, or the lay people have had in the past. Yeah, that is one thing. Or even philosophers. And that, um, and perhaps that's why Patricia Churchland is doing what you call neurophilosophy. Exactly. She's saying that there are findings in, in neuroscience which are mean that, that philosophers need to change some of the concepts that they have or clarify some of the concepts that they have or whatever. Yes. But but my worry is the other way around. It's it's what have philosophers contributed? And and I've admitted the Einstein case in philosophy of physics. So you uh, see, but would you I, admit I, 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 I have to I can't say that sitting in the armchair, somebody is not going to make a contribution to the study of consciousness. I can't say that. Uh, that would be like saying before Einstein that sitting in the armchair, he couldn't have done it. Right. I'm just saying, I'd like to know what this contribution is so far. Yeah, I, I think that's a fair point. I mean, in fairness, you can make the same point about a lot of psychologists from the early, like for instance, Freud, I think probably comes to my mind uh, as someone who, not exactly from the armchair, but from single case studies at least, um, generalized quite a bit from abnormal cases to the general population, a bunch of, in my opinion, wild speculation, uh, which can't be tested in any way that, I mean, and when it is tested, it's shown to be mostly false, except for a couple of things, you know, projection, I it think. is disastrous. Not, disastrous. <laughs> a total disaster. And in fact, I, uh, in Oxford, there was, um, uh, when, when I uh, did, was an undergraduate, uh, there was a post called Readers. This was under being a professor. It was just being under, and there was a wild reader in philosophy, mental philosophy. It's now actually a professorship in philosophy. And it was in the psychology department. And um, the person who uh, uh, gave lectures talked about Freud. And his whole point was that it was not falsifiable. Um, and I think it's a, an appalling disaster that in France and in America, um, Freud uh, still influencing psychiatry and Italy in a way that is less typical in the UK. Mm. I'm not saying that, 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 that there is no, no psychoanalysis, but, but um, uh, it, it's more predominant. And if you look at the development of the diagnostic tool for mental diseases, DSM, uh, you can see the influence of uh, psychoanalysis in some of these terms. Um, yeah. yeah. Don't, so, don't get me on the subject, basically. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. I'll try not to. Um, I, I don't want to keep you all day, so I want to um, let you go. But I wonder if I could just ask you one kind of more general question about the state of the field. Uh, and it has to do with, um, we've been talking a lot about consciousness in, in general, but I wonder what you think about unconscious processing. Uh, yes. Do you think so? Do you think that that has been demonstrated to a sufficient degree the, that you hear a lot about the cognitive unconscious? Not Freudian. I, I, I don't want to. No, 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 I understand. Um, the problem was that these priming experiments that were done in the Netherlands or Denmark, I forget, have turned out to be very difficult to replicate. Um, 
I've worried about it um, in the following way. I have a lot of my best ideas at three o'clock in the early morning. I wake up and problems that I've been thinking about now I've solved. Of course, when I wake up at, at eight o'clock in the morning, they're wrong, but, 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 <laughs> but, but this goes on and on and on. So the worry is it looks as if I'm thinking about these problems overnight. Now, of course, we know that the brain is active overnight, though not in the same state as during the day. But then I say to myself, how do I know that the alternative explanation isn't right? Which is that when I wake up, my mind is clear. And then I hit on the, hit on the answer. Right, yeah. So it doesn't seem to me to prove that actually I was thinking about those problems overnight. Now, I'm not saying I wasn't thinking about them. I'm saying that sort of demonstration, and there are famous ones in science where uh, people overnight uh, dream things or... The or, double helix, you know. <laughs> uh, so on. Um, uh, that doesn't show it. Um, The truth is that I'm off my patch when you ask me the question. And especially when you get old, there's a huge danger that you uh, pontificate about things which are not your expertise. So you've asked me a perfectly decent question, which is about unconscious processing. And I think I have to say that I, I'm not an expert, okay. which sounds very weak. But when I see sort of physicists talking about microtubules and consciousness, <laughs> and it worries me. And I, and I, I heard Eccles, who was a very distinguished physiologist. Yeah, he kind of said some strange things towards the end there. <laughs> I heard him when he was an old man, and. Um, there's a danger. Just look at the ball pad. <laughs> Just look at the ball pad. <laughs> <laughs> I, I appreciate the honest answer. And, you know, going all the way back to Socrates, this has uh, been a problem. That was Socrates' main criticism. And one way of thinking about it was that people who, who were experts in one area thought that that entitled them to say things about another area of which they knew very little. So I certainly appreciate that honest answer. But I wonder, so given that though isn't there a problem for how you set up how we should study consciousness since there it seems like one of the main things we want to do is contrast cases where uh you know subjects take backward backward masking or something like that so they the subjects report that they don't see it and other cases report that they do see it and then we look in the scanner to see what the difference is and we say well when it's not conscious we see this when it is conscious we see that um but uh, that sort of already tends to assume that we have actually a general case of some unconscious processing going on. Well, I think that, no, I mean, we can take that very simple case. If you record cells during backward masking, we know what happens. What happens is the signal is simply much smaller. The, the cell activity goes on for less time. And if you record um, the gross signal, it's much smaller if the mask comes very soon after the stimulus that you're meant to be seeing. So here we're simply talking about um, how big does the signal have to be, the internal signal have to be for me to say, I saw it. Hits as opposed to misses. And that's a simple criterion, presumably, of amplitude. But really, your question was about unconscious thinking. Right. And that's what I'm saying that I I, I'm not an expert on. I see. In other words, I think I can cope with what's happening in backward masking. Mm 
I think that's simply a signal size problem. And if we were able to look trial by trial for hits and misses, my guess is that you would see that the misses, the signal was always below a criterion level. That experiment's not been done trial by trial, but that's what I would guess. Yeah, interesting. Somebody tried to do it. No, so that's 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 good, and I that you're right about what I was doing. So I, I I'm, that's a useful correction. But I wondered. So the last thing I want to ask you about is okay, let me just say one thing because it it worries me this signal because Hakwan Lau has made a particular issue that if you're studying consciousness and you've got a conscious and a non-conscious state, mm -hmm. then the performance must be matched. And he, with me, did an experiment in which performance was matched with backward masking. And in one condition, they were more likely to say they saw it than the other. Now, my worry is that the signal wasn't matched. Oh. Yeah, that's very interesting. I don't know that the signal wasn't matched because you've got to do this trial by trial experiment. But it's just a worry I have. Anyway. Yeah, that's almost going to derail uh, me from can my. Can you just make sure that Hakwan doesn't watch this YouTube? <laughs> he already emailed me and says he is watching it. <laughs> I'm in trouble. I'm, I'm in desperate trouble. <laughs> You'll probably get a scathing call from him soon. <laughs> um, just as a final question, I, I wanted to ask uh, one thing that I think is missing from this conversation, also from your introductory book, which, by the way, which I highly recommend. Um, if you can see this here, I think my is my feed gone dead over here. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Sorry. So one thing I think is missing from the discussion is um, a general kind of theory of what's going on in the brain, um, uh, a theory about what all the firing is doing, all these neurons. And so there's a lot about connectivity, what parts connected to what. There's a lot about what parts are differentially active when we're performing various tasks. But I, I wonder um, what you might think about attempts to kind of give an account of what that firing means. And, and I'm thinking is particularly like predictive coding and these kind of Bayesian models that are becoming very popular. Yeah. So yeah. I just want to get your reaction to that. And also the more general question of how important is a theory of brain functioning to doing cognitive neuroscience? I'll allow you to ask the question so long as you don't use the terms free energy. Okay. <laughs> you use, I didn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> um, The aim of neuroscience is to understand how the brain works. And there are 89 billion cells, neurons, and we know that the astrocytes and so on are doing some important things too, and we don't know what it is. And there can be up to 26,000 connections on 21 cell. So we're not going to understand that brain without producing computational models. And in fact, Lucia Weiner and I published a book, uh, edited a book, uh, which came out last year, in which various computational neuroscientists tackled um, what the cerebellum does and how it does it what the neocortex does and how it does it and what the hippocampus does and how it does it. Now, the, the way I see it is this. Take any one area. It has a unique pattern of connections and it's got a unique inputs, that is, and a unique pattern of outputs. Now, the cell connections within an area are fairly similar across areas, but not identical. 
So we're to think that each area performs some transformation from input to output. Given those set of inputs, the internal wiring, and those set of outputs of the areas it can influence. And it's clear that our job is to find out what that transformation is. And we cannot say that we understand what area A does unless we've specified that transformation. But then you've got the fact that the brain's interconnected. So it's the brain we're trying to understand. So now we really are in a big computational model. Now, um, Henry Markram was given huge amounts of money uh, in Switzerland to try to solve the brain. And he uses Blue Brain, which is IBM's huge computer. Right. And he's worked out the wiring of what's called whisker barrels in rats in rats and mice so they've got whiskers and in their primary area for touch there are what are called whisker barrels and he's worked out the wiring in intricate detail and my problem is how are you then going to go from that to understanding the brain you can't simply add a lot of these together and say you've got a brain You've got to connect them in the way that the brain is connected. Now, I don't see us doing that. So I think the better way is the way that deep mind is approaching it. Mm. That is build circuits which have some resemblance to the brain and by teaching them by giving them experience with faces or whatever teach them to discriminate faces or voices or how to play go or whatever and what really excites me is this there was a a paper recently that came out in which DeepMind looked at how um, you find your way. And we know from uh, rat work in particular, uh, done by John O'Keefe uh, uh, and the Moses, and they got the Nobel Prize from yes. this, <laughs> we, we know um, something about rats, how rats find their way. And there are cells with different properties, place cells, boundary cells, and so on. And the extraordinary finding was that when DeepMind taught their program to find its way, and then they looked inside it, they found that the way it had found to solve the problem was, in fact, the way that you and I do it. Wow. Because, of course, the worry is that you might teach how to play Go, but it's nothing like the way that people do Go, or you might teach how to play chess, but it's nothing like the way that Kasparov does chess. And that's the way that early programs did it. Yeah. That's the way IBM approached it. But the way DeepMind's doing it, and uh, Demis Hassabis, um, who had worked with Eleanor McGuire, uh, on on uh, wayfinding um, uh, at the Imaging Centre in London, um, he's very influenced by what he knows about the brain, but he's building these huge connectional nets with particular properties. And if it turns out that the way they're learning it is similar to, or it, they found the same way of doing it, then we're getting somewhere. 
Yeah, then we're that's a really <clears throat> that's a really cool finding. I'll have to look that paper up and include it in the links down below uh, as well. Well, I'll um, if you send me an email, I'll I'll, I'll email you the, the, the I'll email it to you. Um, that's I mean, thank you because I had a, uh, been my memory is that sixty percent or something of the of uh, I no I I won't give a figure. Um, anyway, go. On. I was going to say, my statistics teacher famously told us that 98% of all statistics are made up. <laughs> 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 but I was just going to say, sure <laughs> the P is less than 0.05. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was just going to say, I was kind of surprised that they, had, when they opened up, they found something because my understanding was they were having kind of problems figuring out what representations, if any, were going on inside DeepMind, especially when it came to like Deep Dream um, and these. Well, Look, I, I may have got it wrong, um, you know. Oh, no, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that. No, 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 no. no I may have got it wrong, but I think that that's what they found. Uh, and um, uh, as I say, I'll, I'll, send you, I'll send you the link. if, uh, okay. And if I'm wrong, I won't send you the link. <laughs> <laughs> it seems to me that that's the way to go. Yeah, very interesting. You know, okay. I wouldn't try to build a brain with the identical connections and so on. It's I'd not go mind root. Right. Yeah, no, that makes sense. So on that note, is there any final comment or anything you want to say before we sign off? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Akron. <laughs> <laughs> Very good, <laughs> yes. <laughs> it seemed totally sincere. <laughs> well, I want to thank you very much for joining me. I know uh, your time is valuable, and I really appreciate you taking this time to talk with me. It was a great conversation. I really appreciate it. Very nice. Okay, I'll talk to you soon. I'll send you that email shortly. Okay, cheers. Cheers. <laughs>